50 miles from London, and I'm heading into the southwest of England to tell the story of a road. A humble road, you may think, but it's a surprising road. It's called the A303. The A303 is famous as the road that passes Stonehenge on the way to Cornwall, and infamous for its traffic jams and bank holiday bottlenecks. I've used it for years to take me to the rivers where I love to go fishing, but like everyone else speeding up and down it each day, I never gave it a thought. Then it struck me that the road was more than just a means to an end, a way to have some fun, that it was an entity in its own right. I realised that the road could lead me into the past. Alfred the Great! Where are you? Hey, shows up, Blue. I'm looking at a Roman fish. But it could also bring me back to the present. It's fresh. Is it? It is warm. I kid you not, Margaret Thatcher was on her hands and knees with me, poring over maps. The A303 catapults us through the stories of a thousand lifetimes. Horns, boys, horns! Most of the time, we just keep driving. But on this journey, I intend to stop. Because the A303 isn't just a piece of tarmac. It's helped to shape an ancient landscape that is at the heart of England. And to satisfy our restlessness, the urge within us to explore the next horizon. The A303 starts round about here, just outside Basingstoke, on a sweeping slip road off the M3. It's the start of a hundred miles or so, reaching into the heart of deepest Devon. It's only been called the A303 for about 80 years, but it's been around a lot longer than that, as the prehistoric Harrow Way or the Roman Foss Way. In the 19th century, it was known as the New Direct Road, running all the way from London to Exeter. Much of the modern A303 makes use of the old 19th century road. And occasionally you come across some interesting relics of that past, such as a hedge, a surprising hedge, right down the middle of the road. Now, on the whole, the modern road has no pretensions to beauty. The central reservation is just concrete and scrubby grass. But here, for several miles at Mitchell Diva, extends this really rather neat and tidy hedge which is quite clearly left over from when the road was a single carriageway affair. And here ahead, an oak tree, a fine oak tree, left in glorious isolation in between these two carriageways, giving a touch of class, if I may say so. Well, it's unnoticed history, isn't it? I mean, it was, it's been here, it's been here for, who knows? The Edwardian man of letters, Hilaire Belloc, described roads as one of the primal things which move us, like fire, a roof above us, or two voices in the night. The road, he said, is the most imperative and the first of our necessities. In the case of the A303, that imperative has become ever bigger, bolder, and more urgent. This is Picket 20, which is a nice quaint sort of name for what used to be a quiet hamlet on the outskirts of Andover, Andover being the first big town 
on the A303 heading west from Basingstoke. And as you can see, I'm under a bridge. The 1960s road didn't have much time for Picket 20 or any other hamlet for that matter. It couldn't quite bring itself to obliterate the place completely, but it did rise up and over it. Modern Britain needed modern roads. Never again would speeding drivers see the whites of Picket 20's eyes. On September the 11th, 1969, the white heat of technology came calling here. That phrase summed up the much trumpeted ambition of Harold Wilson's Labour government to transform Britain into a thrusting, dynamic society fit for the late 20th century. Key to that was a massive road improvement programme. Now we could all go somewhere in our shiny new cars. For every five people in Britain today, there is now one car or lorry on the roads. There are 200,000 miles of public highway. The old A303 at Picket 20 was, like so many others, a product of the Victorian age. Not anymore. I have here the front page of the Andover Advertiser for Friday the 12th of September, 1969. And the main photograph is of the junior Minister of Transport, Mr Bob Brown, standing probably not very far from where I'm standing now, with a pair of scissors in his hand, cutting the tape that declares the Andover bypass open. For Andover, the bypass was a chance to compete with close rival Basingstoke, which was calling itself the Space Age Town of the South. But to the men from the Ministry, there was a bigger dream, to upgrade 200 miles of the old road into a superhighway all the way to the beaches of Cornwall. The dream already had a name, the London Penzance Trunk Road. It began with the Andover Bypass, and at Hampshire's County Records Office, you can still see the original master plan. Book number seven. Here we are, Picket 20 Interchange, and it's uh, conveniently marked on the master plan in, um, in pink. If I turn over the page of this, I think maybe you can get an idea of the quite extraordinary complexity and detail and actually sort of beauty of these drawings. Now this is the position that I was occupying looking down on that roaring maelstrom of traffic. Down here there is a sort of list of everything they show. Lamp posts, every lamp post, fire hydrants. The quality of the draftsmanship, all obviously pre-computer, is quite phenomenal. Not merely is there a reference here to tree to remain, but there's actually a drawing of the tree. What is rather sort of fascinating in a way is that they're completely divorced from the extremely messy reality. And you get some idea here of the sort of devastation to previously peaceful countryside. The surface just torn away. You can't get away from it. It's an ugly scar across the, the Hampshire countryside. To speeding drivers, though, the Andover Bypass is the landscape, never mind all the stuff either side. Here, it slices through one of England's ancient woodlands, Harewood Forest. A long time ago, this forest formed part of the ancient kingdom of Wessex. And within touching distance of the road, is the scene of a thousand-year-old crime that involved lust, betrayal, and violence. And at the centre of it was the King of England, Edgar, rather misleadingly known as Edgar the Peaceful. Edgar, so the story goes, was about to marry. His bride-to-be, Elfrida, was said to be ravishingly beautiful. But the king had never actually seen her. So just to make sure, 
he sent one of his earls, Ethelwold, to check her out. Ethelwold found that Elfrida was indeed a corker. In fact, so bewitching was she that Ethelwold promptly married her himself. So the treacherous Ethelwold went back to Edgar. Well, says the king, what's she like? I'm sorry, your majesty. A base, commonplace girl. Not really worthy of your attention and certainly not worthy to be your queen. Ethelwold was playing with fire and here, within shouting distance of the A303, he was about to get his comeuppance. The king was no fool and he soon found out that his old friend had made a monkey out of him, which was not a good idea. And here, or just about here, the king killed him, stuck a javelin right through his middle. This is where the deed was done. It's called Dead Man's Plaque, a monument erected in the 19th century by local landowner William Ironmonger. Upon this spot, Edgar, King of England, in the ardour of love and indignation, did slew with his own hand the base and treacherous Earl Ethelwold. I really like this place. I like the fact that this cross is hidden among the trees. I like the idea of the romantically inclined local landowner, Colonel William Ironmonger, veteran of the Peninsular War, 200 years ago, went to the trouble and expense of putting this up. And yet nobody comes here anymore. It's virtually neglected. And I like the fact that down there is the A303. You can hear it, but you can't see it. Dead Man's Plaque is hard to find, but it's not the only piece of history round here that's receded quietly into the landscape. A few miles west, a web of old pathways converges on the old 303. One of them was more than just a local track. Known as the Harrow Way, it ran from Dover across southern England to the Devon coast. And it could have been around even before humans arrived. There is a theory, I put it no more strongly than that, that the track I've just been walking down was first walked by, believe it or not, reindeer tens, tens of thousands of years ago from somewhere in the frozen north of Europe when we were still joined to Europe by the hip across what is now the channel. Be that as it may, they were tracks. They were certainly tracks, they were certainly locally used and this is certainly one of them and one of the most important ones. After the animals, reindeer or otherwise, the tracks and roads were adopted by human feet, turning this part of England into an intricate transport hub. It's still a transport hub today, and not far from where the Harrow Way meets the A303, they're building a new track. I like these trees, look. <laughs> well, they call this the Great Shed, for obvious reasons. And its size, well, I read somewhere 20 football pitches and the height of four double-decker buses. The building is a quarter of a mile long and designed to handle 100 lorries an hour. It's a food distribution warehouse owned by the co-op. Yet it's also a mysterious place. To drivers passing just yards away, the shed presents itself as a huge expanse of windowless steel, a building which offers no apparent clue as to its purpose. 
But feeding the nation wasn't always like this. Nearby, in the village of Wayhill, the road once helped move our next meal around in a very different way. Well, this is what I've come upstairs to show you. This is a painting recreating the events that made Wayhill in its time the most important agricultural fair in the country, one of the commercial hubs of, uh, of southern England. The earliest record of the fair dates from 1126, when Henry II ordered some pigs for five shillings. And it also gets a mention in the 14th century epic poem, Piers Plowman. Daniel Defoe, the indefatigable traveller and chronicler of England at the beginning of the 18th century, he was told that they sold 500,000 sheep in the week, well, even allowing for a bit of local exaggeration. The numbers were enormous. Good to meet you. And meet you too. In the bar downstairs, local historian Tony Raper has a map of the fairground from 1683. Basically, the whole area would have been full of sheep, horses, geese, oh, cattle, see, everything. So this isn't the sort of... And this would have been the auction area. So you've got the cheese fair here in the, in the sort of rectangle. We've got uh, joiners fair down here. If you look closely, there's wooden prams, there's chairs and arm, armchairs, all kinds of things. Uh, leather sellers fair with all the skins and everything. This is the horse fair over in this area. And this along here is the old A303 before they built the bike. That's right, this is the Andover side, and here we are travelling towards Amesbury. They say you could even sell your wife at the Wayhill Fair. There's a record of a girl called Betty Duck being sold in these parts for half a crown. There was a fun fair too, with boxing booths and freak shows. One year, a woman billed as a mermaid was put on display. She'd been fished out of Southampton water. And there was drinking, lots of drinking, including a Wayhill tradition that turned boys into men. They called it the Horning of the Colts. These are the genuine horns of, a, of an old-fashioned breed of sheep. Yeah, that's right. On here, there would have been a receptacle full of beer, and the whole thing would have been balanced on the head. <laughs> and if, and whilst, whilst they were uh, in the room, they would have been joggled and jostled, and they would have been singing him a song all the time. It was, it was basically horns, boys, horns. Horns, horns boys, boys, horns, and sing like his daddy with a large pair of horns. Horns, boys, horns. <laughs> Horns, boys, horns, sing like horns, boys, horns. <laughs> I think that's enough of that. <laughs> the song goes on, so swiftly runs the hare, so keen runs the fox. Why shouldn't this young colt grow up to be an ox? They haven't sung it round here for decades. It's I have been to Wayne Fair and know what sights I did see there to tell me tale and make you stare and see the horns are showing. They come from east, they come from west, they bring their worst, they bring their best. And some they lead and they drive the rest into the fair at Wayhill. In the end, two things killed the Wayhill Fair. Tough rules on testing for TB and the new era of railway and motorised transport. Shepherding your flock long distances to market just wasn't worth it anymore. And in 1959, after almost a thousand years, the Wayhill Fair sold its last sheep. It's not easy to imagine this place as it once was, thronged with beasts, shepherds and cattle men in a dry autumn with the dust rising in a huge cloud over here but it's also nice to report that the place hasn't been completely wiped away but rather a history lives on the way hill fair is not entirely dead Beyond Wayhill, Hampshire soon turns into Wiltshire, the second of five counties the A303 cuts through on its way west. The road beneath me is late 20th century vintage, but the landscape around it has a much older story to tell. Here we are, just 
turning off. Oh, oh, not an easy manoeuvre in a Morris Traveller of the old days. And here we go. I hope the suspension can take it. This is one of my favourite places along this road, Beacon Hill. There's a tremendous view of the landscape falling away to the south. The A303 is just below, but our impact on this part of the world goes back much further. From where I'm standing, in all directions, dotted around the place, are ancient, prehistoric burial mounds, tumuli, barrows. Some of them disappeared under the plough or under buildings. Many of them still visible. And when you drive along the A303 through this part of the world, you're in fact driving through a prehistoric graveyard. Who were the people who first lived and died on the Neolithic 303? Drive a mile further on to the Solstice Business Park and you can, in a manner of speaking, get to meet one of them. Here he is. He's called the Ancestor and he was made from welded steel by two local sculptors. As we can see from his prognathous forehead and wide nose and sunken eyes, he's ancient, ancient man, says the text here, on his knees, head thrown back, arms open wide, reaching up to the skies, rooted into the moon, protected by three magical hairs. Unfortunately, the magical hairs seem to have hopped off. I like to think of him as one of the first travellers round here. And I like to think of him maybe one day getting up off his knees and having a look round at the Holiday Inn behind and the A303 up there. Maybe the Harvester Pub round the corner and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut. Of course, the ancestors are product of someone's imagination. But the real thing is closer than you think. This is the Amesbury Archer, an early Bronze Age traveller from the Alpine region of Central Europe who was buried within a stone's throw of the A303. Hidden for over four millennia, his grave was disturbed by builders in 2002. This wasn't just a pile of old bones, it was the richest Bronze Age burial site ever found in Britain. Sixteen barbed flint arrowheads, knives, wrist guards and metalworking tools suggest he was a craftsman who was also useful with a bow. But that wasn't all they found. I'm holding in my hand the two oldest gold objects ever found in Britain. And to be honest, I'm a bit terrified. They're so fragile. These are believed to be ornaments for the archer's hair. And how extraordinary it is to think that 4,300 years ago, when these were made, that they were thinking of decoration in those terms. It raises the question, who was the archer and what was he doing here? One of the critical things that we know about him is that he was a metalworker. 
he understood how to transform metal into objects, and this would have been an, an amazing process. And the locals here didn't have that, did they? Absolutely. It was a new technology. So he was a man on a mission, a man who may have been on a pilgrimage to actually show other people how to work metal. But he was obviously um, a person of some importance, and, and the gold um, ornaments that we looked at earlier indicate this. Absolutely, yeah, because the gold A was very unusual. There probably was no one else in this country no. at the time who would have had objects like that. And very few people would have owned objects made from copper. And one of the really unusual things about this burial was the fact he was found with five pottery beakers. Um, hardly any burials of this period have been found with so many. The average beaker burial would be one beaker. This chap had five. So he was a five beaker man. He was a five beaker Whereas man. Whereas you and I might have been a we might have we been one beaker. We probably wouldn't have even been one beaker. <laughs> Suffering from a slight attack of beaker envy, I'm leaving the archer behind. He was a man who would have known the Neolithic 303 like the back of his hand. But did he come all that way across Europe just to impress the locals with his metalworking skills? Or did he have a more specific reason for coming here? I suspect he did. And that's because of what lies over the hill ahead. OK, whoa, this is going to cause trouble. OK. Well, here she is. So let's get out and have a look. It's the A303's most famous landmark, Stonehenge. We're quite a distance away. And the stones look rather small, don't they? From here, they're also overwhelmed by the traffic. But step to one side, and you'll see why I've stopped here. They do look small, but what you get from here is a sense of their context, of where they stand in the landscape. The great open sky, the wide open spaces, the rolling grassland, and the monument in the middle of it. And I know English heritage will hate me for saying this, but actually, we're just close to the road. It's not a bad place to be stuck in a traffic jam, because it'll give you perhaps the best view of Stonehenge there is. A proper car, well, a what, real car. I what do you it, think of it? I think she's beautiful. She, I like it. Oh, yes. She, she has to be. I'm going to give you a guided tour. Robert Key grew up in Wiltshire. In 1983, he became the local MP. MP for Stonehenge, you might call him. The A303 runs right through his old constituency. This must have been one of the first cars that has flashing orange indicator lights instead of flippers. Oh, instead of those things. <laughs> I often wonder what... Today, Stonehenge is a world heritage site, which loosely translated means interfere with it at your peril. But we weren't always so protective of it. During and after the First World War, the Flying Corps were based here. And the military were allowed to do pretty much as they wanted. I've seen a photograph of an army Land Rover perched on top um, of, of the stones, um, brought here in the middle of the night after a particularly good evening in the officers' mess over at Lark Hill, which is only a couple of miles. Um, and um, goodness knows how they got it up there, but they did. They wouldn't get away with it today, <laughs> would they? They certainly wouldn't, no. But would they get away with this today? In the 1950s, cranes were brought in to rearrange the stones. Sacrilege, some said. These are the stones that were, re as it were, re-erected. Yes. These, these massive ones. Yeah, absolutely. And the other one, the smaller ones here, were they were they were okay. They were just, some of them were tilted. Were, they were tilted. Yes. Yeah, so they were straightened up a bit. Yes. But you can see on that stone there, there's a great big wodge of concrete. Yes, I see. Holding yes. it up. Yes. Which people don't really think about when they go past the stones. Were they at an angle? Were they yes, lying they down? Were. How, were. Leaning sort of high. Mostly how li lying down. Some, the tops of the stones, had 
disappeared. So just, oh, right. And so they put them back on top. Uh, and it was a major reconstruction, really. I mean, I think over the years, something like 23 stones have been re-erected with the lintels put back on top. In the early days of motoring, the A303 was a mere slip of a thing, which didn't trouble the stones at all. How things change. Today, the roads are scourge, noisy, dirty, and often gridlocked. There have been many plans to reroute it, over 50 in fact, including one to bury the A303 in a tunnel. All fell by the wayside, despite Robert's best efforts. In the 90s, he struggled to find a solution as competing government departments, public pressure groups, and even the Druids locked horns. I thought, well, there's only one thing to do, go to the Prime Minister. I kid you not, Margaret Thatcher was on her hands and knees <laughs> with me in her room in the House of Commons, poring over maps of all the possible routes oh, yeah. around, discussing which land belonged to the Ministry of Defence, which was National Trust, which was English heritage. Um, and she was really engaged on it. Even Margaret Thatcher was defeated by Stonehenge. Even, my, even Margaret even Thatcher. Margaret, John Major. Bless him, did the same, same, poured over the maps, but then absolutely nothing happened. Well, now at least everyone can shut up about it. <laughs> oh, no. Right. This problem's never going to go no, away. The, the A303's the... going nowhere. Apart from the monument itself, the place that's paid the heaviest price for the Stonehenge stalemate is the next village along, Winterbourne Stoke. Every rescue plan for Stonehenge included a bypass for Winterbourne Stoke. It was promised a thousand times. It never came. Weep for Winterbourne Stoke, the village that the bypass forgot. A couple of miles further on, the A303 has been improved. No bypass, but new dual carriageway. After Amesbury, the road develops a slightly split personality. One minute super highway, the next super bottleneck. <laughs> this delightful spot could be the oldest crossroads in this country, quite possibly one of the oldest crossroads in the world. Today, the A303 crosses the A350 Blandford Devizes Road. But if you scroll back four or 5,000 years, Two paths crossed here. One, north-south, known now as the Great Ridgeway. And going east-west, the Harrow Way, which we've bumped into before. 3,000 years after the Amesbury Archer, I might have met another European traveller here. This time, however, he would have been no wandering metal worker. This man would have been a warrior from Denmark, with plunder and slaughter on his mind. A couple of miles north of the road, I've come to pay my respects to the man who, I like to think, would have done his best to save me from the bloodthirsty Dane. Is that not an amazing sight? This 18th century folly was built to honour King Alfred, the only one of our kings we still call the Great. It was completed in the 1770s, cost £6,000, three quarters of a million at today's prices. Well, that was a mere flea bite to Henry Hoare, 
the colossally wealthy banker who commissioned it. He'd already built Stour Head, the mansion down the hill, and the gardens around it. And this tower was designed to complete his vision. The Danish invaders swept all before them until they had a go at Alfred's Wessex. And it was here, or round about here, in AD 879, that he gathered his men to march north to the edge of Salisbury Plain, where he inflicted a devastating defeat on the invader and brought peace to this country for more than 100 years. It's 160 feet to the top, 205 steps. That is a staggering sight. And below me, the woods of Starhead, silvered with frost, waving in the breeze. Well done, Henry Hall. Where I'm standing here, I'm pretty much astride a geological fault line that marks a complete transformation in the landscape along the A303. Away to the east, you can't see it on a day like this, which is a shame, but you can take my word for it, is Salisbury Plain and the Chalk Downland. And just about here, the chalk gives way to green sand. From here on, the fields are smaller, greener, lusher, defined by hedges. The stone is browner. The land has a more intimate, more friendly feel, if you like. Alfred the Great, where are you? The Danes weren't the only invaders to send a chill down the spine of the A303. Long before them, the greatest empire builders of them all were here. At Ham Hill, just across the county border in Somerset, I've come to see if I can find them. It's a terrific view from up here. Some people might say, slightly spoiled by having a road running slap bang through the middle of it. But it's a very special bit of road, this. It runs dead straight for miles. And there's a clue for you. What we have down below me here is not just A303, but Roman 303. It's called the Foss Way. Built soon after the Roman invasion of AD 43, it runs diagonally across England between Exeter and Lincoln. The one thing every child knows about the Romans is about their roads, that they build straight roads. Um, and it happens to be true. For part of its journey, the Foss Way merges with the A303. So here we have the long, straight stretch of A303 Foss Way, one and the same. And then at this point, the 303 deviates off to the right, and the Fossway continues in a dead straight line. I think we should go and see what lies down there. So we're going down this little, uh, this little turn here. If my calculations are right, we should come back onto the Fossway. Does that look like it? It's tarmac now, but as recently as 250 years ago, remnants of the original Roman surface survived described even then as tightly paved 
and looking like a wall on its side. I would guess this is probably about 15 feet, 14 feet wide. Uh, and this would have been uh, the width they needed for just moving soldiers and carts and chariots and what have you. In places, the Fossway has cut what looks like a canyon into the ground. You can see the trees and banks absolutely soaring high above. And now the road runs along the very bottom of a very dark crevasse. And ahead continues pretty much in a straight line. The Romans were here for almost four centuries. And having come all this way, their high flyers and bigwigs would certainly have demanded a decent place to live. Ten years ago, at Lopen, half a mile from the Foss Way, archaeologist Alan Graham helped unearth evidence of some very impressive accommodation. Forgive me, I thought you were planting your spuds, but uh, can't deep, be that. Too deep even for my potatoes. <laughs> After digging it up, the extraordinary find was covered over again to preserve it. So you and I are going to kneel side by side. I have been given a very elegant implement here. Uh, and just show me where we're going to start. Basically, pull the earth towards you. Yeah. Lift time and see what happens. The, it feels quite solid. It feels extremely oh, solid. The oh, earth you've got, is... You've got red there, look. It's a mosaic approaching 2,000 years old and part of a once palatial Roman villa. Well, you've got to think about it as a standing building with, with stone walls and, and stone tiled roofs. Today, we're only revealing a small part of it. The whole thing measures 12 metres by six. That's the beginning of the next panel. I think this is going to be the exciting one. Right. You're, oh, look at that. It's two magnificent worms side by side. But I don't want to cut them in half. It would be unkind. Look, look at their beauties. We're revealing in this panel here. What do you think it is? This is one of the designs in a panel. If I was asked to guess, I would say some sort of uh, water creature. Am I getting, getting warm? From yeah. from distance, that's what I think. Scores of Roman villas have been found in Somerset, many of them two-storey buildings with luxurious bathhouses and underfloor heating. Uh, the Roman invasion of this part of the world was led by Vespasian, was it not? They say apparently he started his working life as a street cleaner in Rome. So you've been told. And yeah. then eventually when he got back, he became... Uh, became emperor, went back to Rome, emperor, yeah. built the Colosseum. Yeah. All a bit murky and uh, muddy at the moment. And you can see how, how filthy it is, but already the, the, uh, the paler ones are showing up paler. I'm lost for words. I'm looking at a Roman fish. Come and stand beside me and let's have a, have a look down. Sure, it looks so much better from up here. It does. You get a great view of it. You feel, you must feel a sort it's of... It's wonderful, because it's, it's there, it's just as it was. They certainly had a sense of style, did they not? I think they did, I think they did. And uh, the creature, dolphin, sea snake, marlin, whatever, looks fantastic. It does. It's a tribute to the skill of the people who made it. Beautifully engineered roads like the Foss Way were part of the Roman legacy. But for hundreds of years, we let them go to ruin. By the mid-1700s, the A303, like so many other roads, was in such a bad state that the government was forced to act. Yes, they told the public, you can have new roads, but you'll have to pay for them. In return for filling in all the potholes and ruts, the local groups of businessmen and investors were told they could charge for the use of the roads. They could demand tolls, which was a bit of an outrage, really. Fancy having to pay to use the King's Highway. 
Toll roads, or turnpikes as they were known, sprang up everywhere, including here along the A303 near Ilminster, where you can still see the odd 19th century milestone. The section we're on now was probably a rather narrow lane that was heavily rutted. Um, it was often said that some of the pre-turnpike roads, the sloths that would fill with water would be so deep they could swallow a horse. <laughs> Using income from tolls, rutted and waterlogged surfaces like this could now be upgraded to high-tech engineering like this. The method was inspired by the Romans, but reinvented by a new breed of road builders. Men like the government's general surveyor of roads, John McAdam. McAdam realised that what you needed was stones which were smaller than the, than the, than the, the width of the wheel and, and were angular, so they would lock together. I see. And who, who actually... It must have been a tremendous business getting all these stones down, cut to the right size. Or... Well, it was, uh, it, it was the lowest form of manual labour, but it wasn't necessarily an unpopular form of labour because it, it was a kind of job that families could do. So the men would break the larger stones and the women and the children would sit by the side of the road breaking the stones. Children! Poor little children! <laughs> it said that the way that they would check the smallest stones had got to the right size was you would, you'd be able to get it in your mouth. <laughs> Whether it was the children's <laughs> mouth or the surveyor's mouth, it's not right. clear. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> the Macadam method transformed long-distance travel, but the new roads didn't come cheap. In the early 1800s, the Honiton Ilminster Turnpike charged one and six for each horse, almost as much as the average man earned in a day. Overall, in your view, the system worked. It had a very bad press towards the end because it was, they were charged of local corruption and inefficiency. But I think if you, took, if you take the broad view of it, the, the difference between what the road system was like before the Regency period and by the middle of the Victorian period, yeah, they made a significant improvement. The improvement didn't just happen at Ilminster. By the early 19th century, the entire A303 had been turnpiked with incredible results. Before turnpikes, a journey from London to Exeter took four days. After turnpikes, it came down to 16 and a half hours. The Exeter London Royal Mail coach Quicksilver led the pack, priding itself on the brevity of its rest stops. 10 minutes in Exeter, 13 minutes in Andover, and you were expected to eat your dinner in that time at one o'clock in the morning. And the necessary changes of horses were like Formula One pit stops, executed in a matter of seconds. At the Dillington Estate, close to the A303, William Hanning, driving force behind the Honiton Ilminster Turnpike Trust, basked in the glory of his achievement. But for him, 16 and a half hours to London still wasn't fast enough, which is why Hanning decided to invest in a new idea. Brainchild of the Victorian inventor Sir Goldsworthy Gurney, it was a stagecoach powered not by horses, but by steam. To hear more, I'm meeting Dillington's present custodian and descendant of William Hanning. So, Ewan, here we have Sir Goldsworthy Gurney's new steam carriage. Now, can you give me some idea of how this beast actually worked? It had to do with the fact that it was this jet steam engine that was so much lighter than an ordinary steam engine. And, was that... and that was right at the back of the, of the carriage. But the big problem was that you had to ride on top of the actual boiler. And here's your, your, your chimney. With all the steam and, and the smoke steam coming out. out. And I, so I imagine, I mean, A, it was quite dangerous, and B, I suspect, quite hot and probably dirty. Despite support from celebrities like the Duke of Wellington, seen here on a road test, the idea struggled to make a profit. 
the machine was targeted with sky-high toll charges, and also, on one occasion, by an angry Luddite mob. Girls with a gurney had blood coming from his head as a result of the attack. Really? Yeah, and they had to go and retire to an inn. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe well, retiring to an inn. Uh, indeed, like well, it. possibly this one where it <laughs> yeah. says "Good Ales." Good ales that, that's that's right, the sort yes. of that's the, that's what we need. The stagecoach <laughs> managed to see off Gurney's steam carriage, but its own days were almost up, thanks to the coming of the railways. Toll roads were rapidly phased out, and the train reigned supreme. But when the age of motorised road transport finally dawned, the A303 was ready. This is the successor to Hanning's Turnpike. The modern A303 Ilminster Bypass. With three lanes and no central reservation, it's one of the road's most notorious accident black spots. But it's not just drivers who are dicing with death. Joining me on the bypass is Arthur Boyt. I think that was a well-matched badger, actually. Oh, really? Arthur is a man with a particular interest in the A303. It's my road of choice up to the London area, partly because it's more direct than M4, but because there's always a lot of stuff to be found on it. Um, I've picked up a lot of uh, good dinners uh, <laughs> off the A303, uh, a, a road deer on one occasion, Oh, look, 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 we have a fox. A fox. Oh, a fox. A bit mashed up. There was a, a lovely badger right in the middle of the 303, and I knelt down in the middle of the road to photograph it as a lorry was coming the other way. <laughs> I don't think he was sure what to do, but it made a beautiful picture. There's a badger. There's a badger. That's quite good condition. That was quite... And this is very close to the spot where I picked one up. I would think 15 years ago. Really? And I took that home and ate it, yeah. Here's something coming up. What's this? That's a pheasant. Well, I think if we turn around somewhere here, maybe we can stop and investigate the pheasant. Where was the pheasant? Somewhere up here. Ah, oh, here it is, yeah. I Looks think the first okay thing, to Arthur, is to get it out of the out of the way. Pull it over here. Right now, let's have a look. Now, if I saw that, I'd say that's a bit of all right. No, thank you. Very, a bit of all right, he says. It, it's, <laughs> it's had a bit of a wallop, but it's fr it, fresh. Is In it? fact, it is warm. It's still warm. It's warm. It, it's been. It's been killed within the hour, I would say. Really? No, no rigor mortis, see? It's had its head bashed a bit. It's a bit ironic that this bird has survived the, the shooting season... And has perished. ..and has now died on the road, yes. But yes. at least we can console ourselves with the thought that it has not died in vain. No, it's not going to be <laughs> wasted. And it'll probably get hung for a day or two, and then uh, I shall prepare it for a casserole. Can I ask you whether you'll be able to persuade your wife to share it with you? <laughs> no, she's a vegetarian, <laughs> and uh, she uh, she doesn't really want to. <laughs> Carriageway on the A303 heading west, the last bit of big road. And from now on, it turns into more of a country road, bending and twisting its way into the Black Down Hills. And it's quite extraordinary how diminished it is from the grand highway that we remember back in the beginning. 
beginning. And we're now in Devon. The road is on its last legs in a manner of speaking. For me, it's one final breakfast. Annie's tea bar is on the last lay-by, just yards from the end. Good morning, ladies. Well, hello. I need some breakfast. Yeah. It's urgent. Is it? But it's a nice morning, actually, isn't it? It is very nice morning. There we are, one large tea. Oh, look at that, eh? Okay. Brown sauce. You're a fine woman. We get asked now for cappuccinos and things like that. And what? <laughs> it's, a, it's a truck stop at the end of the day. That's what it is, you know. So if uh, I came uh, in and uh, said, could uh, I have a cafe latte, <laughs> you, you'd just laugh at me, I wouldn't would, you? I would, yeah. God bless Annie. The highways agency have taken her loose away, leaving her to install her own. And the big chain diners have tried muscling in on her action but she's a survivor. So where are you off to, Tom? Well, this is almost it. We're nearly at the end of the road. Ninety-two miles after I began, the A303 just ends. In a way, you could say it ends nowhere. No fanfare, no flourish, no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The A303 finishes just here as the A30 comes in from the left and the road west from now on is the A30. It's a cruel trick. Exeter is only 25 miles away, but the A303 is denied the glory of going all the way. I think there's something rather satisfying in a way in this sudden ceasing to exist at just at this point, at the whim of some highway engineer or the man who does the road signs. One thing I've learnt is that the bigger and faster the A303 gets, the less it reveals of itself. In 1969 at Andover, it was full of confidence in its present and its future. As I've travelled westwards, I've seen it narrowing, almost as if squeezed by a dawning uncertainty about itself. Frustrating for drivers, I know, but maybe not such a bad thing all round. Perhaps the A303 best serves its landscape, not when shutting you off from it as you speed to the next horizon, but when it persuades you to slow down or stop so you can revel in the horizon you've already reached. You can find you 